but it's something that we actually can learn and probably need to learn. I see a lot of people very stressed out, very stressed, very tense, very overwhelmed, and you just think, why, don't, why can't they just relax? What, what is going on? What is, what is making them tense? What is making them unhappy in their life? And uh, so this is a skill that I want to suggest to you that you can develop and it will have many benefits in your life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about relaxation and why we need it. So this is how, when, when I walk down the street, this is how I think most people look, kind of just a little bit, you know, on edge, a little bit overwhelmed. And we've all had days like this where we kind of feel pretty, pretty yucky and the thing I want you to think about is that you can see this in your own mind. When you're not relaxed, what are you? The, the brain's pretty simple, the mind's pretty simple. We, we kind of got like a, you're doing this or you're doing that. You're feeling good or you're feeling bad. You're relaxed or you're stressed. Maybe sometimes you're a little bit in between. But when the mind is stressed, when the mind is full of anxiety, worry, woe, fear, panic, tension, tightness, how does it feel? How does it feel? It feels very tight, very cramped. It feels um, like you're being squished. It's not expansive. It's not open. It doesn't feel uh, spacious. So this is the, the opposite, this kind of mind state openness, expansiveness, freedom, is the opposite of this tight, cramped mind that we get when we're not relaxed. So I, I want to show you how you can experience this. So we're just going to close our eyes very briefly and we're going to take some deep breaths. We're going to take three deep breaths, okay? So closing your eyes, breathing in. Filling up the chest all the way up to the tops of the shoulders and holding and then slowly with control exhaling. And another deep breath in. Holding and slowly releasing. And one more. Deep breath in, holding, and slowly releasing. And then just gently opening the eyes again. Can you feel a difference? Can you see the benefit? Did you notice what changed? So often when we're stressed and tense, we don't even know how stressed and tense we are until we start to relax. Just as when we breathe, we're not always breathing very well. So we, we don't breathe deeply, we don't breathe fully, we don't uh, uh, use the full capacity of our lungs. So we don't get the full benefit of our breath. And in the same way, when we relax, we often don't relax properly. We don't relax in the right way. We don't get the full benefit of relaxation. And that's because when we relax, usually we're not actually relaxing. We're just taking a kind of activity that is less intense than our usual life. We're taking an activity that is not so demanding maybe something that we can tune out with. So how, how do you relax? What do you do to relax? Some people like to do a bit of gardening. Some people like to do some painting. I used to enjoy popping bubble wrap. <laughs> what do you do to relax? Think about it. What, what is your go-to relaxation activity?
And is it truly something that is relaxing? So the definition of relaxation is to be free from worry and free from tension. So when you're engaged in your relaxation, are you free from worry? Maybe. Are you free from tension? Maybe. Are you fully free? I think for most of us, this is how we relax. <laughs> So we kind of tune out a little bit and we think, okay, if I just focus on this, I can relax. I can relax from the world around me. I can just chill out here in this zone that I've delineated for myself. But of course, as you know, here we are kind of trying to sleep late at night, the soft blue light of the screen getting into our eyes, that, that light is actually quite tense for the eyes. It, um, it's very bright and it actually stresses out the eyes. Apparently there's all these people now going slightly blind or myopic because of the, the tension of looking at a screen. And I felt it myself, you know, this kind of um, suntan, like computer suntan that you get from the light of a screen. It's kind of like... Eh. And also, you know, the hand, the poor hand, not free from tension. The, apparently people are losing the use of their thumbs. <laughs> Carpal tunnel syndrome, RSI. Um, so maybe this is not a good form of relaxation. It's not free from tension. It's also not free from worry. We're so anxious about this kind of relaxation. We, uh, just want to sit there and chill out and yet the information that we're gathering, the stuff that we're exposing our to, ourselves to, just stresses ourselves out even more. And then we're worried about it, we get stuck in this cycle, this loop, where we're checking, we're worried that we haven't uh, checked, we check again, we keep on going back to it over and over again. And this is actually a cause of frustration. And so we're not free from worry, we're not free from anxiety. It's the same with things like um, resorting to entertainments um, to chill out like Netflix or YouTube or um, uh, zoning out with a book or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I'm not anti-technology. I'm not anti-hobbies. But what I'm trying to point to is that this is not true relaxation. Like, even when you go to the beach on holiday and you lie down in the sun, you start to get a sense of what it's like to relax here. Yeah? You start to get a sense of what it means to do nothing. You're literally doing nothing on the beach. Just stopped. You've stopped. And this is a, a, a kind of glimpse of what it's like to get some relaxation in our meditation practice. So anyway, maybe the things that we do uh, are not fully relaxing. That's just something I want to posit to you. Another kind of way that we think that we relax, or maybe that we think we need to relax, is uh, taking intoxicants and uh, trying to chill out artificially, I guess. So when we um, have a busy week at work, we build up a lot of tension, a lot of tightness in our minds and we just want to release it. Or even when you've had a busy day, uh, you want to release it that night. Some people have busy, stressful mornings and want to release it at lunchtime or some people start even earlier. So this, this kind of um, relaxation is an artificial one. It's a numbing. It's an escape. It's a kind of fantasy. And it's not helpful because we can't always have our relaxation of choice. We can't always have a little spliff. We can't always have a little glass of wine. And so we might get stressed and dependent upon it. And if we're dependent on it, we're not, we're not free. We're reliant upon something. And so this is a, a drawback of um, this kind of artificial relaxation. So we have to name it. We have to understand okay, this is something that I'm doing because maybe there's something feeling agitated, feeling tense uh, within me, and I'm trying to release it, 
And so I'm using a, a, a false form of relaxation. It doesn't mean that it doesn't chill you out. Of course it does. Of course you become nice and chilled, nice and relaxed. The problem is that you can't rely upon it and that you'll suffer if it's taken away from you. So true relaxation, of course, isn't dependent upon anything external. True relaxation comes from within. And that's what meditation is. Meditation is doing absolutely nothing. And it's wonderful to do nothing and then relax. And then relax and do nothing. It's wonderful. We're so busy in our world. We have so many things to do. We're always moving forward. We're always planning. We're always wanting to be busier and busier. Um, what is the word? FOMO. FOMO, fear of missing out. Meditation is JOMO, the joy of missing out. And it's good because you can settle. You can become calm and relaxed. It, it has actually many, many benefits, meditation. And some of them are, are purely physical. So when you practice meditation, uh, you are lowering your blood pressure. You are allowing the, the muscles in the body to relax. The sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, gets a nice break. You are um, you're allowing the heart, the pulse rate, to reduce. So it's a physical benefit of meditation. There's also cognitive benefits from meditation. Your concentration will improve. Your memory will improve. The synapses in your brain become more plastic. So you start to create new neural pathways in your mind. So that's pretty special too. This brain plasticity means that we can change the way that we perceive things. We can change the way we experience our world. We can start to develop more positive mind states. And there's also emotional benefits from meditation. So we feel less tense, less tight in the mind. We have more joyful mind states, more positive mind states. We feel more emotionally stable. This is an important one. We have. Uh, uh, more of an equilibrium. We're less susceptible to extremes of depression and anxiety or mania and mayhem. And so these are some emotional benefits. And then there's social benefits that come from meditation. Social benefits include things like just feeling more connected to other humans. Things like meta-meditation, produces more empathy in us. Uh, we have better listening skills. We're more centered. We're more able to help each other when we do some meditation. But these are all just very trivial. These are all just um, mere baubles on the spiritual path. The true power, the true benefit of meditation is that it develops wisdom. So this is a spiritual benefit. And this is the whole point of meditation. But to get there, we need to do some relaxation. However, one of the problems for us when we're pursuing a spiritual path and we're practicing meditation is that we can go about it the complete wrong way. And <laughs> this is something I see all the time in meditation. I, I mentioned last night, uh, don't treat your meditation practice like a chore. It's not a job. It's the exact opposite of a job. It's like be as negligent as you can. Do as little as you can. See how much you can get away with. Stop. Don't do. But a lot of people, for some reason, get the wrong message. And they, they start to do things um, in really unwholesome and unhealthy ways. Even the Buddha, before he was the Buddha, took a few wrong turns on the spiritual path. And so this is a, a very famous image. It's the image of the fasting Buddha. So when he was trying to discover enlightenment, 
he tried lots and lots of different aesthetic practices. Aesthetic practices are things like uh, self-denial, um, practices like standing on one leg for three days or never lying down, fasting, kind of putting the body through all sorts of torture and trials. Uh, this is quite a temp this is actually quite a tempting thing to do in a lot of people's practice. Some people have a, a, a tendency towards um, self-flagellation, you know. Some people have a tendency towards uh, harsh, hurtful mind towards themselves. A mind that wants to punish themselves. Oh, if only I do six hours of meditation, then I haven't done enough. I need to do seven, I need to do eight. I need to sit still, I need to not move. I need to uh, be harder on myself. I need to force myself. I need to will myself into enlightenment. And th the Buddha, when he practiced this way, he would do things like only eat one grain of rice a day. And then he said, my body became like an 80-year-old man or a corpse. My bottom became like a, cow's, a camel's hoof print. You know, it's just the, uh, just the pelvis. And I, my bones became like the, the rafters in an old barn. You can see the ribs poking through there. He said, if you touched my stomach, you could feel the spine. So he said that the gleam in his eyes dulled and became like the gleam of water way down in the bottom of a well. So he said that this was a wrong way to practice. Eventually he worked out, hey, I'm not getting any joy. <laughs> I'm not getting any benefit from this practice. It's not leading to positive states. It's not leading to wholesome mind states. It's not leading to happiness. It's certainly not leading away from suffering. So you can imagine the mind of a person engaged in these kinds of practices, very hard, very firm, very fixed, very uh, uh, powerfully, almost aggressive to themselves, hurtful, harmful. And so this is the kind of mind we want to avoid when we come to doing our spiritual practice. So this is the kind of mind that is the complete opposite of relaxation. And the real make, uh, sorry, the real break that the Buddha had when he was uh, not yet enlightened was recollecting an experience that he had when he was a child. And this experience was him as a boy sitting under a tree in his father's uh, properties. And he was just lying there against the tree trunk, just chilling out, just relaxing, not trying to do anything, not trying to get anything, just being. And he was able to just slip into the most beautiful, most peaceful, deep meditation without even trying. So all this effort that we put into our practice sometimes is like going about it the wrong way. Maybe instead of trying to get something, we can just let go. Maybe instead of forcing ourselves to practice harder and harder, we just need to chill out and relax, allow things to develop within us. And then we can be a little bit more like the Buddha. You know, he's able to sit for hours in meditation, all night in meditation, but not through a force of will. just by letting go, not responding, not reacting, not pushing forward, not going back into the past, just being present, centered, is very easy, very still, very peaceful. And when you've got that, you don't want to do anything. You don't want a new experience. You've got contentment. So this is the opposite of, of how we live our lives, really, this kind of peace, this kind of contentment. And it's the opposite way that we often um, 
practice in meditation. We're using our will, we're using force, we're trying to put our mind on the breath, trying to keep it there, trying to control. And this is willpower, but this, is, this, is, uh, this kind of control is not very useful, actually, because it is a, a, a false kind of mindfulness. So you notice that I haven't even started uh, really talking about meditating on the breath yet. It's because your minds are not ready. You just come in from a busy life outside. You are not ready to just focus on something so subtle. It's much better to just relax, chill out, develop some positivity, develop some peace, and then the mind naturally becomes calm and peaceful. So, we don't try to control our mind in meditation. We just let whatever comes, come. We don't try to push anything away. We don't try to force the mind to do something. We don't try to force it to watch the breath. We just allow that mindset to develop naturally, and it will. So I think one of the problems with the way that meditation is taught today is that it is taught um, for a particular purpose, to develop mindfulness. Um, and mindfulness is just one aspect of our meditation practice. And actually, uh, meditation practice is just one aspect of our spiritual life. So often when people come to uh, the spiritual life, they first start off with meditation. and this is great. I mean, you'll get some benefits from meditation, many benefits from meditation, but it also means that we're missing out some of the fundamental things that support that meditation practice. So one thing that I've noticed is uh, meditation is being used increasingly as a tool to help us deal with our lives, uh, to help us uh, become more productive, more... Um, more focused, more um, concentrated on our jobs, or to help us become more present. Um, basically, what's happening is we're t shouldering the responsibility for a very difficult life and busy world, and we're expecting our mind just to somehow make everything in life better for us, as if we can just magically come from a horrible, busy world and just magically, by the force of sitting down for 15 minutes a day, change our lives completely. But what actually meditation is, is the result of a life well lived. Good meditation comes from living well. You don't use meditation to try to fix your life. You fix your life and then you enjoy good meditation. So the background to this is that we need to look at how we're living. How are you living your life? You sit down to meditate, you have all this tension, anxiety, fear, problems, remorse, regrets come into your mind. That's because of how you're living your life. So we don't use meditation to improve our life. We improve our life and then the meditation will naturally help. The meditation will naturally give us some wisdom. So it's, it's this kind of chicken-egg kind of thing. We, we can use it um, in, in both ways. But the, the thing I want you to take away from this session is that it is actually a process. And we can't force it. So we need to look at how we're using our meditation. If you're not getting relaxation in your meditation practice, if you're only getting tension, anxiety, um, fear, or tightness in the mind, if you're using a lot of will, if you're using a lot of force, then this is not deep meditation, this is not good meditation. Good meditation is open, spacious, good meditation is peaceful, good meditation has joy and delight in it. So when it comes to our spiritual practice, uh, it's like a process of cleansing. So when we have a spiritual practice, 
we don't just start with meditation, we start with our ethical framework. We start looking at how we're living. So in this context, on this retreat, you've taken the opportunity to practice in a way that doesn't harm living beings. We're not killing anything in this um, centre. So we, we don't have this regret come into our mind about hurting other beings. We're not stealing anything in this centre. We don't have fear that we're going to get in trouble, that we're going to get caught. We're not committing sexual misconduct. We're not cheating on our partners. We're not uh, raping or abusing anyone. So we don't have a, a, the bad uh, consequences of those types of actions. We're not talking, so we're not lying. <laughs> we don't have that feeling that comes into the mind when we've told a untruth. We're not taking any alcohol or intoxicants. And so we're not likely to get into any trouble. We're not going to um, engage in behaviours that we have no control over. We're not going to embarrass ourselves or accidentally cause harm to other beings. So these are a protection for us. So sometimes when it comes to a spiritual life, when you start hearing about rules, you kind of go, ugh, and you think, I don't have to follow those rules, do I? But they're not rules, they're protections. They're things that benefit us, the things that restrain the mind from becoming uh, unwholesome and from having unwholesome consequences from our actions. And then when we have a mind that has unwholesome uh, qualities in it, we can start to become aware of those and purify them. So if we're aware that we've got regret in our mind, if we've got anger in our heart, if we've got a lot of desire in our minds, then it's good to acknowledge that so that we can start to wash the mind clean. So the Buddha uses this beautiful image of the dirt washer, which is a, a good symbol for our meditation practice, our spiritual life. It's a process of purification. So we know that we've got all this stuff inside us, we've got all these problems, all these difficulties, all these things that make us unhappy. But when we restrain our actions through things like precepts or any ethical framework, any moral framework that we embrace, then we're starting to reduce our suffering straight away. And so, first of all, we get rid of those big things, those big defilements. And so the, the dirt washer, the, this image that the Buddha uses, is the process of purif purifying gold. So we've got gold inside us, but it's kind of mixed up. Gold is a conglomerate, so it's mixed up with little bits of rock, little bits of dirt, little bits of um, this and that. And so it needs to be purified. And so the dirt washer comes along with the pan and starts washing the dirt. So the first thing to get removed is the coarse defilements, the, the, co the coarser elements like mud, dirt, starts to get washed off. The rocks, pebbles, start to get washed off. And then you keep washing, keep washing, smaller grains of sand, the middling kind of things that, that trouble us start to get washed off. And then you're left with just the gold dust at the end of this process. And then when you've got that gold dust, then you can start to work with the gold and you start to make it, you start to heat it up, you start to make it uh, malleable. And then once you've done this, the mind is able to be worked with. And this is what meditation is. So it's a process. It's a chain of events. So when it comes to sitting down on a meditation retreat, you don't suddenly expect to get enlightened. You don't suddenly expect to have a still, peaceful, concentrated mind. You've been living a very busy life. You've been doing lots of activities. You've got lots of things in your mind. It's going to take some time. So chill out, let it happen, relax. It will happen all by itself. I never forget the first time I went back to Sydney, my hometown, after living in a monastery for some time.
got off the plane, went down the escalators. You know how there's always one person on the escalator with their luggage blocking the escalator? So anyway, I was wearing my robe. I'd never been on an escalator before with my robe on. And so I was being really careful that I wasn't going to get caught in the thing and end up, you know. Uh, so I was looking down and trotting down this long escalator and going down, down, down. And then suddenly there's this woman in front of me with her bag and I had to kind of stop. And I think she felt me like stopping just right behind her. And she just turned around and looked over her shoulder. And I don't think she knew that I was a monk. She, was, she, she knew what she was going to say already. She turned around and said, why are you in such a hurry? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know. I'd just gotten caught up in the excitement. I'd just gotten caught up in the energy. You know, when you're at the airport, everyone's in a hurry. I was going to catch a train. I, would, I didn't need to be anywhere. I didn't need to do anything. I was just in the slipstream of all these really busy people moving through the city. And I just got caught up. I actually just reverted to my old habits. I was no longer a monk, but you know, walking down the street like a, 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 a worker on their, in their lunch break or something. So it was, a, it was an important moment for me because I realized, actually, why am I in a hurry? Why? What am I trying to get? Where am I trying to go? And this is an image, actually, that the, the Buddha uses to talk about the activities of the mind that we start to steal through the process of meditation. So he uses the image of a person walking quickly. So there's the person is walking quickly, and then they think to themselves, why am I walking quickly? Why don't I walk more slowly? And so they start to walk more slowly. And then they think, why am I walking slowly? Why don't I stand still? So they stop and they stand still. Why am I standing? Why don't I just sit down? And so they sit down. And why am I sitting down? Why don't I lie down? And so they lie down. So each successive posture is more relaxing, more comfortable. And this is the image the Buddha used to talk about the sankharas, the, the volitions, the mental formations, the activities of the mind. The mind that's always willing us to do something, always wanting us to do something. And this is the thing that we need to stop before we can get good meditation. This is the stuff that we need to let go of, that we need to relinquish this um, activity we need to take out the part of the, the, the sequence of events that is causing us agitation. So that's where we can make this uh, break in, in meditation is by becoming calm, by becoming soft, by becoming peaceful and allowing these uh, successive stages of posture, of comfort to become more and more inclined towards peace. So the good news for us then is that we don't actually have to do anything. We don't have to try. We don't have to force. We just have to have some patience. We just have to allow these things to happen. A good image for us to work with is the image of a lotus flower. So it doesn't have to be told to open up. It doesn't have to be forced to open up. It opens up slowly, all by itself, without any willpower, without any uh, agitation, without any force. It opens up all by itself, naturally. This is a natural sequence, a natural sequence of events. And in the same way, when we are living a good life, when we are ethical, when we have the protection of an ethical framework, it could be a Buddhist ethical framework, 
any other kind of ethical framework that you work with, if you adhere to that ethical framework, you will have benefits in your mind. You will be bl blameless. You will have no regrets in your heart. It's these things that agitate the mind when we come to sit down. If you've been well behaved, if you've lived a good life, then when you come to sit, you're already in a really good place to practice. The mind is clear. The mind is free from remorse, free from regrets. And when you're free from regrets, you start to get good feelings in the mind. You get pity. Do you know what pity is? Pity, pity is like this uh, feeling of rapture that comes into the body, this thrill, this excitement. Even before pity appears in the mind, you already have gladness, you already have joy, pamuja. This joy produces the pity. And this pity, this rapture, develops and develops, becomes bigger and bigger, and becomes sukha. Sukha is bliss, pleasure. And when you have this, the body is so relaxed and calm and peaceful, the whole mind-body phenomena is tranquil. This tranquility is delicious. And this tranquility allows the mind to become deep and still in samadhi. And then when you have samadhi, you start to develop wisdom. You start to see the true nature of reality. You start to see how the mind works. You start to see how phenomena works, you start to see the Dharma. When you get this, you start to develop higher stages of wisdom, you start to get on the path towards um, becoming more dispassionate in life, mm -hmm. towards uh, becoming less, um, uh, less en enticed by the things of the world. And this will, of course, lead all the way up to high stages of development on the path and Nibbana. So it's a process. It's a process that starts with uh, life outside of our meditation. So we don't use meditation to get a good life. We use good life to get good meditation. So that forms a wonderful feedback loop. And the more we see the nature of the, uh, the way we're living through the clarity that comes from meditation, the more we want to live a good life, the more we want to live a good life, the better meditation we'll have. So it's cause and effect. So when it comes to your spiritual life, think of it as a holistic thing. Don't think of your spiritual life as the few minutes that you come and do some meditation. Don't think that meditation is going to improve your life. The 15 minutes you do a week or whatever. What about all those other hours, days that you're not meditating? I'm pretty sure for most of you that you spend more time not meditating than you do meditating. So that time is actually more important than the time that you spend meditating. So if you're angry, at work all day, come home, you yell at your family, smash things around in the kitchen, then you go, oh, I better do some meditation, you come sit down. All that you're going to see is anger, pain, hurt. All you're going to have is regret, upset. And so, if you can see that, then the only thing you can do is to try to live a really good life. Watch your ethical behaviour, watch your speech, watch your interactions, so that when you come to sit, the mind is clear, the mind is happy, the mind is peaceful, and that's where meditation will really take off for you. And so, the key really, as my teacher Ajahn Brahm says, is to relax to the mat. Relax as much as you can in your meditation practice. It's kind of like hack. Um, it's kind of like, you know how they say, if you fake it till you make it. So if you smile, some teachers teach you to smile a lot when you're meditating. Uh, because they've done some research apparently that when you smile, when you fake a smile, the, the brain actually thinks, oh, okay, we're smiling now, so the muscle memory triggers some sort of neurological response and creates the tiniest little bit of happiness response in the, in the brain. 
So they, they tell people if you're unhappy, then smile because you, you can trick the mind into thinking that you're happy. In the same way they say that people who are depressed or um, sad, they hunch forward, they kind of depress this, this heart center here, this chest becomes all sunken and, and miserable. And so they say if you want to improve your self-esteem and improve your happiness, you open up the chest, open up the heart center. And it has a psychological and physiological effect on the body. So you fake it till you make it. Yeah? In the same way, when it comes to our meditation practice, we want that calm. We want that peace. But we might not be able to get it straight away. And so the way that we start the process happening is to relax, to let go. And so that's why when you've heard the instructions I've been giving for the meditation, I've been saying, letting go, relax. I'm pointing your mind in the direction that we need to go. So we're not using any will. We're not using any force. We're just inclining the mind very, very, very gently towards positive, wholesome, skillful, beneficial mind states. So that's why we're meditating. And so this is what I want you to be feeling like in your meditation. I want you to be so relaxed that you lose control of your tongue. So relaxed that you can actually feel the softness in the body. You don't have to sit up straight. You don't have to be rigid. You can allow the body to sit comfortably, naturally. You want to feel the relaxation in the body. You don't want to feel tight. You don't want to feel tense. Every time you feel this tightness, this tension in the body, you can feel it in the brain, in the mind. So you want to start with relaxing the body, getting the body comfortable. And when the body is comfortable, the mind naturally will become calm, naturally become peaceful. And then mindfulness, not forced, not through a process of will. Mindfulness naturally will appear in the mind. The breath will suddenly become clear, will suddenly become present, and that breath will become a delicious, uh, sweet, sexy experience that you want to be engaged with, not something that you're forcing your mind to focus on. And when the breath becomes really delicious and beautiful, you know that you're present, you know that you're aware. And this breath, this beautiful breath, takes you deeper and deeper and deeper into your practice. So this is why um, I emphasize this skill of relaxation. So it's something that we can do in our meditation practice, but I would encourage you to relax a little bit more in your non-meditation practice, in your life. So take things a little bit less seriously, be a bit more loose to life. Uh, sometimes it's really important to remember that we are actually um, on a very small planet in a very large universe hurtling through space. And although our problems are real, and although we have difficulties, in our life, they're actually, in the big scale of things, not very important at all. And so there's a bit of perspective that comes through uh, just chilling out. And this is what we lose in, in our um, work life sometimes, or in our social lives, in our home lives, in our family lives. We start to become very single-pointed. We lose perspective. We kind of paint ourselves into a grumpy corner. We put ourselves in a pain cage. We make our lives stressful. And uh, this is because we've lost perspective. It's because we haven't been practicing relaxation. No one wants to be around a person who's stressed. No one wants to be around a person who's grumpy and tired, angry, mean. We don't want to be around a person who's like that. And yet, that's the kind of person we often are 
to ourselves. So when it comes to meditation practice, when it comes to your spiritual development, please be kind to yourself. Be gentle. Don't force. Don't use willpower. Use wisdom power. So instead of forcing, instead of controlling, let go. Be kind. Be gentle with yourself. And then you'll get many, many benefits from that. And so this is why I say relaxation is a skill to develop in meditation and also a skill that we need to develop in life. And you can do uh, this very simply by just taking some deep breaths, by consciously telling yourself to relax. The Russian, the Soviets in the, in the Cold War, they developed this... Um, uh, psychological program where they used auto-suggestion. Auto-suggestions when you tell yourself, relax. <laughs> and they realized that actually when people do auto-suggestion, that the, it starts to create neural pathways in the brain. And the more you do this, uh, this auto-suggestion, the quicker the response time becomes, the deeper it becomes, and the more solid those results become. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to do some relaxation and I'm going to use a, a, a process of auto-suggestion with you that you can uh, adopt in your own life. And it's similar actually to a yoga nidra. Have any of you practiced yoga? You know the relaxation that you do at the end of yoga? So this is, this is a good thing to practice because it brings up the relaxation in the mind and that's what we're going to do. Do we need to move around a bit first? Yes, we need to stand up, move, uh, maybe come back in five minutes.